Hi, engineers. In this video, we are going to talk about GI motility, but we're primarily going to focus on the motility of the esophagus and the motility of the stomach. And we'll have a very, very brief intro on the fundamentals of GI motility. But again, that is going to be the primary focus of this video. It's going to be, again, the motility specifically occurring within the esophagus and in the stomach. Okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Here's the thing when we talk about GI motility, for pretty much all of them, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, they all have different types of motile uh, functions. So what do I mean? So when we talk about motility, they're gonna come in three different flavors, okay? One is it can come in what's called segmentation, okay? And we'll go into all these in detail for each individual uh, organ. But segmentation is this type of activity that causes a lot of mixing and churning. So here, let's say the two, let's at least get the big functions out of this. Segmentation has two big functions. One is it loves to mix and uh, mix the chyme with digestive juices. Let's just put it like that. Okay. So its design is whenever the actual, this is more common in the small intestine and even in the large intestine. For example, let me take my hands here. Okay. And my hands are going to be representing the intestines. What happens is a large area of the intestines will actually, their circular smooth muscle will contract and it'll create these rings. The circular smooth muscle will contract and produce rings at multiple different points of the intestines. But when it does that, it contracts at another point and it just keeps mixing and mixing the chyme contents. It helps with the digestive process. So one thing is it's really, really good at being able to mix the chyme with the digestive juices. And by doing that, it helps to increase the absorption of nutrients. Okay. So it really helps to aid in this digestion and the absorption of nutrients. This is again more common. Uh, within the small intestine and in the large intestine. But again, this is more for the mixing, trying to mix the food with the digestive juices to help to break that substance down and the segmentation also allows for the mucosa, we'll talk about that in the histology of the GI tract, the mucosa, the inner lining of the GI tract, to come into close contact with that substances to aid in the absorption of the nutrients. The second motile function is going to be propulsion. Okay, so it's going to be called propulsion. And this propulsion, we can also kind of use another term, and that is called peristalsis. Now, peristalsis is defined as the alternating wave of contraction and then relaxation, whereas segmentation was you're moving the chyme a few centimeters forward and backward and forward and backward to help to aid in that digestion absorption. Peristalsis is trying to move the actual substances along throughout the GI tract so that it can be moved into a certain point of the GI tract to be absorbed or it can be eliminated from the body. So the pur purpose of the propulsion is to move the, um, let's just say, GI content along GI tract. Okay, whether it be for elimination or pushing it to the next segment of the GI tract so that it can be absorbed. All right, so that is really, really important with this. The last one that I want to mention here is the reservoir. Okay, the reservoir function, or we can kind of say a storage function here. This is going to be where certain organs like the large intestine and the stomach, they can actually hold food substances in them for a long period of time. The large intestine can hold a lot of the feces in it for a long period of time, and the stomach can hold a lot of the food contents in it for a, a decent amount of time, maybe four to six hours and stuff. So it can actually act as a reservoir function. Now, the significance with this is that this is carried out, and we'll talk about a couple of these along the way, uh, this journey of GI motility that we're going to go on. It's carried out by sphincters. Now there's a bunch of different sphincters that we'll talk about. We'll talk about the upper esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, gastro, um, I'm sorry, the ileocecal sphincter, a lot of them that are going to be really, really important, internal, anal, external, anal sphincter. But they're basically acting as reservoirs or storage. They can help to play a role within the reservoir function of storage of certain contents, GI contents within these different uh, organs, okay? And you'll see that whenever we go through each individual one of them. 
Now, one more thing about smooth muscle. When we talk about smooth muscle, there is two different types of uh, contractions, okay? There's rhythmic contractions. The rhythmic is more carried out by a lot of this segmentation and then this propulsion. So this is more of your rhythmic, okay? So in other words, it's going for that alternating contraction relaxation type of activity. The sphincters, they play more of a tonic contraction role. In other words, they have sustained contractions. So that's important. Remember, rhythmic is kind of like alternating contraction relaxation, whereas tonic is more of a sustained contraction. Now, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. We're going to keep this super, super simple. Let's say that we take a smooth muscle cell, and this smooth muscle cell has the ability to depolarize, okay? And let's say that it also has the ability to contract. Now, in this smooth muscle cell, you'll notice we're going to kind of go back and forth between the smooth muscle cell and this graph so that we can get a, con a good understanding here. So if we come down to the graph here, we're going to assume that this smooth muscle cell is at its, uh, you know, usually smooth muscle cells have a resting membrane potential. You know, somewhere we can say, you know, around, let's just say for this one, it's negative 80. That's what we used for the other smooth muscle video, right? So let's assume that it's like negative 80, okay? And then let's say that there is another point, which is the threshold potential. And let's assume that that's, you know, pretty constant. And let's assume that that's negative 55 millivolts, okay? What happens is, is our smooth muscle cells, particular smooth muscle cells, let's assume that this is what's called a interstitial cells of Kajal. These are pacemaker cells. In other words, they have the ability to spontaneously depolarize and generate action potentials that can cause the rest of the smooth muscle, the GI tract, to contract. Okay? Now, how do they do that? They generate these things here called slow waves. Okay? If you guys, again, we've talked about this in the smooth muscle video. Go check that out if you haven't already. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. But it produces these subthreshold waves, and these subthreshold waves here are called slow waves. Now, these slow waves, what causes them to be formed? Okay? Well, if you look here, in this smooth muscle cell, it has these leaky calcium channels. So here's a leaky calcium channel. And what it allows for is it's kind of always open and it allows for a little bit of calcium to trickle into the cell. And this little bit of calcium trickling into the cell helps to kind of depolarize the cell. You know, slightly depolarize it, bring the inside of the cell becoming uh, from resting to a threshold, right? That's its goal. Now, here's the thing. These threshold, these sub-threshold waves, they're obviously not enough to be able to trigger an action potential. So sometimes, and the reason why is, is as this cell starts kind of depolarizing and getting ready to approach threshold, there's special channels that open up in the cell membrane when we get close to that threshold portion. And that is, if we don't actually hit threshold, there's potassium channels that open and the potassium actually leaves the cell. If potassium leaves the cell, what happens to the inside of the cell? It becomes negative. So what are you gonna see here? This rise will be due to calcium. If it doesn't hit threshold, potassium channels open, potassium leaks out and it starts to repolarize. Here's the thing. We should understand what are the things that can cause the cell to become, uh, to get to the level of threshold. And that is going to be things like, for example, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, which is released by your parasympathetic nervous system, by like the vagus nerve or the sacral, uh, uh, the actual uh, S2, S3, S4 nerves, or it could be hormones, for example, gastrin, okay? There might be other ones like cholecystokinin, secretin, maybe even another one called motilin. The whole point here is that these guys have the ability to load cations into the cell. So let's say that they have a way to be able to somehow stimulate a lot of cations to flow into the cell making the cell super positive. If that's possible, what this can do is, is it can stimulate this sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is inside of these actual smooth muscle cells. 
It might be doing it through certain signaling processes, again, that we talked about in that video, but let's just assume that it was enough that this was trying to cause the sub-threshold. If it didn't hit threshold, potassium channels open, potassium leaks out, repolarizes. Let's say that it produces again, tries to produce another slow sub-threshold wave here. It doesn't get to the point, but then we have this extra stimulus from acetylcholine, gastrin, motilin, all those things that load cations into the cell. And then guess what it does? It brings it up just enough to break the threshold value there, okay? What brought it from this point to this point? It was the extra assistance from acetylcholine, gastrin, motilin. There could be other factors as well, stretching of the, of the uh, GI tract organ, certain types of uh, humoral chemicals, but it's just enough to break the threshold value. Once it breaks the threshold value, what that does is it stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So let's say that this is our sarco plasmic reticulum. In the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there is tons and tons of calcium ions that are stored here, or sequestered here by cal sequestrin and cal reticulin and stuff like that. But it's stimulated by this depolarization enough to push a lot of this calcium out here into the sarcoplasm. If the calcium is pushed out into the sarcoplasm, what can it then eventually do? Depending upon if the enzymes are present, it can help to initiate the cross bridge formation. And let's say that this is a smooth muscle cell that it actually can contract, it will generate a contraction. Okay? That's important. Okay? It's super important that we understand this. Okay? So, again, let's say that we have the sub threshold, not enough. Then you hit a point where it's trying to generate a sub threshold, but we get this extra assistance from neurotransmitters, maybe hormones, maybe stretch. It brings it above threshold. When it brings it above threshold, it's enough to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to push out calcium ions. Calcium ions, along with the you know, different myosin light chain kinase enzymes, will play a role in initiating the contractile response. So what you see when you look on this actual graph here is the point at which it actually passes this threshold, it produces what's called spike potentials. So in other words, let's say that you have a really large release of acetylcholine, a lot of gastrin, a lot of different hormones, and what they do is they bring this depolarizing wave really, really high above the threshold. The higher above threshold, the more spike potentials you produce. And the more spike potentials you produce, the more intense the contraction. So in other words, the force of contraction will be high on this one, but it'll be super high on this one, okay? So that's important that we understand that, okay? And again, just remember, the interstitial cells of Kajal, they're the ones that are basically generating the actual potential. So really what they're doing is this calcium is being released, and they could be connected, like imagine here, like imagine like this. Imagine here is a smooth muscle cell, and here's another one, here's another one. Let's say this one right here, is an interstitial, this is the interstitial cells of Kajal, okay? They have little gap junctions that connect them between the cells, okay? And let's say that this guy was the one that was depolarized, okay? If he's depolarized, that calcium can be released and pushed into these different cells. If the calcium is pushed into these other cells, and let's assume that these cells are the ones that contract, then again, the calcium will help to initiate the contractile response. Again, calcium plays a role with activating calmodulin, which activates the myosin light chain kinase, which phosphorylates the myosin head and plays a role within the contraction. Okay? So again, understand that. That gives us the basic fundamentals that we need to know for motility. Again, the basic functions, segmentation, propulsion, reservoir. What does the esophagus do? Out of all of those, what is the primary function of the esophagus? All right, so now what I want us to be able to do throughout the process of these GM motility videos is to co uh, combine and ask, ask ourselves, okay, what does the esophagus do out of those three functions? It doesn't do any segmentation, but it does do propulsion. Its design is to transport the GI contents from where? From the oral cavity, whenever we swallowed it, into the pharynx, right? And we're going to take it down to the stomach. That's its function. It doesn't really play a huge role in the reservoir function. It do, there is something that we should talk about with respect to this sphincter and this sphincter, but again, it's not really acting as a reservoir for uh, 
very much time at all. But usually food is transiting through the esophagus pretty quickly, okay? Food and fluids. So its primary function out of all of these is going to be peristalsis. So please don't forget that his primary function is going to be peristalsis. Again, how, how would you define peristalsis? It's the alternating wave of contraction and relaxation. Okay, it's a rhythmic activity. Now, we, if you guys haven't already, we have a video on the enteric nervous system and we also did a video on deglutition where we talked about the esophagus. So we're not gonna have a super in-depth conversation here. I'm gonna get the basic things across again. But it's always good to repeat things. It's always important to do that. It helps with helping us to remember these, these concepts, okay? Let's pretend here I have a nice big piece of pizza, okay? Nice big piece of pizza. There's some pepperonis here on it, some cheese. Mm-mm, good. What happens to this piece of pizza? What is it going to do? Let's assume that we, we digest it. We break it down with our mouth and stuff like that. Use certain enzymes to help to break it down chemically. We chew it up, right? So it's going to be a bolus. But what it'll do is it'll start causing the stretch of the esophageal walls. Stretching the esophageal walls, if you guys remember, it activated some stretch receptors. Let's assume that here, this is the stretch receptor and it picked up that stretch in the actual GI wall. When it does that, it has the ability to activate or inhibit two different types of neurons, okay? Now, if the actual food is right here, the bolus, we're gonna wanna pinch this edge in, okay? So we're gonna want this part, so I'm gonna kinda create like a little pinch here. This part here, I'm gonna wanna pinch to kind of occlude the lumen, preventing the food from going back up, right? I wanna pinch that edge in. So I want this part to contract. And then I want this part here, distal to the actual bolus, I want this part to relax so that it can receive the bolus. So that is important. So now how does it do that? We're gonna go pretty quickly through this since we've already talked about it. You have this plexus here, which is present in between, here's your muscularis externa, right, of the esophagus. There's a inner circular and then there's an outer longitudinal. So what is this one right here called? This is the outer longa Tudinal layer, and this one right here is the inner circular layer. And then again, what is this plexus right here called? This plexus, if you guys remember, was called the myenteric plexus, or Arbox plexus, we called it, right? And it consists of ascending neurons and descending neurons. In this case, what would we want to do to the ascending neurons here? We'd want to stimulate them. If we want to stimulate this point here, here's what's going to happen. These neurons here are going to come over to this smooth muscle layer there and this smooth muscle layer here. All right, and let's just say one more, like at that level and at that level, okay? We want these guys to be stimulated. Now, when that happens, if you guys remember, we release specific chemicals onto the circular layer to cause it to contract. What are those chemicals that we released? If you remember, it was acetylcholine and substance P. And that stimulated this circular smooth muscle layer to contract and cause this indentation into the esophagus to push the food forward. The longitudinal layer, though, we don't want this to contract. We want this part to relax. Okay, so if that's the case then, we want to release vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide onto that level. Then we want to stimulate these guys, these inhibitory neurons, these descending ones we can say actually, the descending ones. So now the descending neurons are going to be stimulated. And if they're stimulated, let's say that we come to this part here. Now we're going to have this smooth muscle here, and let's say this one here, and then we'll come to this layer right here and this layer right here. Now, this was the proximal portion. We wanted the circular layer to contract because it constricts it and pushes it forward. We want the longitudinal layer to relax so that this part uh, proximal to the bolus doesn't open up, okay? Because when the longitudinal layer contracts, remember, it opens the actual lumen. This part down here, we don't want the circular layer to contract now. 
because that'll actually produce a constriction ring. We don't want that, we want it to relax. So in this case, we're gonna wanna inhibit the circular layer. So we're gonna wanna release what's called vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide in this region. But we're gonna want the longitudinal layer to contract so that it opens up that aspect of the lumen. So it'll release acetylcholine and substance P here. Okay, so don't forget that. That is the main function, and it's going to keep doing that. So it'll come right here, right? They'll say that the bolus gets to this point. Now this part will contract, and then this part distal to it will relax. And it'll keep doing that, pushing and propulsing or moving this bolus towards the stomach. That's the significance of it. Now, what I want to do is I want to completely tie in, because it just it makes so much sense to tie it in, two clinical correlations associated with the esophagus, like uh, dysfunctions in their motility. One is this sphincter here. Look at this sphincter, guys. This one is called the upper esophageal sphincter. Okay, you kind of refer to it usually as, they write it as U-E-S. And if you guys remember, we said that the upper esophageal sphincter uh, was primarily made up of the cricopharyngeus, okay, which was innervated by the vagus nerve. In certain people, usually as they get older, okay, it's more common in older individuals, the walls of this part of the esophagus become weak, okay? And as they become weak, what can happen is just above that, it can form a little outpouching or a diverticulum. What is this outpouching or diverticulum called right there around that level of the cricopharyngeus or the upper esophageal sphincter? This is called Zinker's diverticulum. And again, this is more common in older individuals, but usually it is a uh, outpouching just above upper esophageal sphincter. Now, some of the problems with this, with the Zinker's diverticulum, is that if you think about it, the food is gonna have a hard time being able to continue to pass through, right? So sometimes, and even the food can actually cause this backup, so it can produce trouble with swallowing. So one of the big symptoms that you see with these uh, individuals is they have dysphagia. Also, sometimes this food, whenever they're like laying down or they're trying to go to sleep, some of this food can try to go into the uh, respiratory system. So it can aggravate the respiratory system, maybe causing some cough or regurgitation. So you might see some cough, you might even see some regurgitation. Here's another sign though. Let's say that a food just starts percolating in there and sitting in there. And as that starts percolating and sitting in there, it causes some really nasty smell. And that nasty smell that we start seeing is called halitosis. So another sign can be halitosis. Usually how they diagnose a Zinker's diverticulum is they send the patient to do what's called a, a barium esophagram. They just inject them with, they put some dye, all right, so they don't inject, they give them dye. And if the dye that they swallow collects into a little pouch behind the esophagus, that could be an identifier of Zinker's diverticulum. So what they usually do is they go and they actually remove that diverticulum and then fuse that layer together, okay? So that's important to understand that. Now, another one, that's associated with the esophagus is what's called ecclesia. Okay, so there's another one, which is called ecclesia. Ecclesia is really important because this is usually a situation in which they lose the myenteric plexus in the distal part of the esophagus, usually around this sphincter here. What is this sphincter here called? This sphincter here it's got so many names. I'm gonna put LES for lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter or gastroesophageal uh, sphincter, right? So there's a bunch of names for these, but in the distal part of the esophagus, they don't have a myenteric plexus or Arbach plexus, right? So there is absent myenteric plexus. Now, think about this super simply. The bolus comes here. Let's assume that it's here now. What will happen? This part will contract. This part will relax. 
Then again, you'll come to this point here. This point will contract. And then this part down here should relax. But guess what? It doesn't relax because it doesn't have a myenteric plexus in that region. If it can't relax, can the food move into the stomach? No. If the food doesn't move into the stomach, then the food just accumulates right here. And so all the food proximal to this actual portion where there is no myenteric plexus just accumulates and starts dilating the esophagus. So what you'll start seeing is you'll see what's called a mega esophagus or a dilated esophagus. Mega esophagus. Usually these people will present with dysphagia, trouble, or difficulty swallowing. They'll also have some regurgitation, okay? They'll have a lot of coughing, okay? Another thing is you'll start to see that this patient is going to have a really hard time being able to hold down food because they're going to have weight loss. Okay, so they're going to have weight loss, maybe some malnourishment. So these are all some symptoms that can actually happen here. Now, with aclasia, what they do is they actually send the patient um, to do what's called a esophageal manometry, okay? All it is is they take like a little manometer, like a pressure gauge basically, shove it down the dude's gully into their esophagus and measure the pressure. If the pressure in the esophagus is usually greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, that's pretty darn high, and that's usually maybe an indicative sign of someone who has, might have some type of situation where there's the obstruction of the food, maybe aclasia, maybe some other cause, but it's usually an identifier. There are other tests that they can go with for that. But again, obviously they would have to maybe treat it with surgery or they can give certain chemicals. Uh, there's a, you know, they can get the botulinum toxin. They, they can actually treat patients with aclasia with the botulinum toxin. They can give them nitrates. They can give them calcium channel blockers, different things. Okay, but that is um, something that we should truly understand with respect to the esophagus. Okay, so that covers the esophagus. Now let's move on to the stomach. All right, so now we covered the esophagus. Now we're going to go ahead and start about the stomach. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so now when we talk about the stomach, this guy is super important because we have to compare him with... Uh, these functions that we had. Okay, so we had segmentation, we had peristalsis, we had the reservoir, or the storage function of it. Out of those, which does it actually play a role in? Okay, so here's the thing. When we talk about the stomach, it kind of does like a segmentation, but we don't really call it segmentation. Instead, we call it mixing. So when we talk about the stomach, there's going to be three significant functions that we should know about. One is it, soars as, it serves as a storage, okay, or a reservoir, okay, so a reservoir. Another thing is it plays a very, very crucial role in mixing, okay, mixing or uh, churning, if you will, the different gastric contents, the food that we're ingesting and trying to break down. And it also plays a very, very important role with what's called emptying. Okay, in other words, trying to empty the contents of the stomach into the actual duodenum. So we have to understand each individual function, the storage function. How do we do this? Now we have to talk about, here's what I want you to do. It's going to make your life a lot easier when we talk about the stomach here. I want you to think about all these different functions with respect to the three phases of gastric secretion. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, we have videos on it on the cephalic, the gastric, and the intestinal phase. But I want you to just think about it super, super simply. Okay, in the cephalic phase, which is basically what? So the cephalic phase was the sight of food, was the thought of food, was the smell of food, the taste of food. All of these things had the ability to activate the vagus nerve, the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve. Now, if that's the case, then these efferent fibers of the vagus nerve, what, what do they do? Look at this. This happens before food even enters into the stomach. It can come to this portion of the stomach right here, and it can cause this portion of the stomach. What is this portion of the stomach called? We should have a little breakdown here of the anatomy. This right here is called the cardia, this portion here. This portion right here is actually called the fundus. This portion right here is going to be called the body. And then this portion right here, we're actually going to say is the pylorus. 
Actually, we'll go to we'll go up to about right here. We'll say this is the pylorus. Okay. So again, what do we have here? We have cardia. We have uh, fundus. We have the body or the corpus. And then again over here we have the pylorus. All righty. Here's what I want you to think about with the stomach. The stomach is kind of weird. It actually can act as two individual organs, if you will. The fundic portion and the upper aspect of the body can act as one specific, have one specific function. And then the remaining part of the body and the pylorus have another function. Here's what I want you to remember. The pylorus and a little bit of the body play a role in the mixing and emptying function of the stomach. Whereas the fundus and a little bit of the upper part of the body play a role within the reservoir function of the stomach. Now, this goes back into this first phase, which is the cephalic phase. So now we're gonna talk about what happens here in the cephalic phase first. So we think about the food, we see the food, we taste the food, we smell the food, all of these things are happening before food even enters into the stomach. When that happens, it activates this vagus nerve. The vagus nerve will come to the fundus. Now here's what's weird. It stimulates nerves here to trigger the release of what's called vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide. Guess what that does to this part of the actual stomach smooth muscle? It relaxes it. So now, if it relaxes it, let's represent it like this. Here, let me get this out of the way so we can really understand this. I wanna do it like this. So now again, what is it actually having coming here? This is the vagus nerve, cranial nerve, 10, and it stimulates the release of vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide. Again, what nerve is this? This is cranial nerve 10, okay, which is the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve. Don't forget that. Now, when it releases this vasoactive intestinal peptide and nitric oxide, look what it does. It actually causes this portion, I'm gonna represent it like this. It causes this portion of the fundus and the upper part of the body to relax. So now look what happened here. It relaxed, it went to this portion here. This is that fundic relaxation. This right here, where the stomach, the fundus of the stomach and the upper part of the body of the stomach relax in response to the cephalic phase, this is called receptive relaxation. So what is it called? Receptive relaxation. This is so cool. The stomach is getting ready to receive the food. And so it's starting to cause this dilation or the relaxation of the fundic smooth muscle prior to food even being in the stomach. That's unbelievable. It's accommodating, it's getting ready. Now, let's say that we follow the bolus to the next point. So let's say here is our, our bolus. So here was the first part here, okay? So now the food is gonna come down, right? It's gonna come through the esophagus and it's gonna come in here into the stomach. Now, it gets into the stomach and as it gets into the stomach, the stomach is gonna start stretching. It, the, the volume's gonna start increasing. So as the volume starts increasing, it starts causing some distension, some stretching within the walls. As it starts triggering some distension or some stretch within the walls, remember what that does. It triggers a local reflex to trigger the release of VIP and nitric oxide, right? As that happens then, what is that gonna do? It's gonna promote even more relaxation. So now, look at this. We're gonna accommodate the food even more now. So now we stretched out an extra capacity here. You know the stomach has a, it can continue to uh, occupy a large volume of content without increasing in the intragastric pressure. So here's the important thing I want you to remember. When this guy comes in, this bolus, it comes into the stomach. It does something. It actually increases the intragastric volume. It starts stretching on the walls, causing distension, activating the myenteric reflex, but also just realize that it's not just this reflex that can happen. If you really want to remember, do remember that there is some stretch receptors here that can pick up the distension in the walls and they can come here and activate the afferent, the afferent fibers of the vagus nerve can activate the efferent fibers and trigger this long reflex. So remember there can be long reflex arcs and short reflex arcs. Either way, both uh, are important, but again, within the cephalic phase, 
It's the sight, thought, taste, smell of food. Food is actually not even in the stomach yet, and the stomach is already relaxed and receptively uh, uh, ex expanded and dilated to receive the food. Then the food gets into the stomach, increases the intragastric volume, distends the stomach, stretches the stomach. Again, triggers either a long reflex arc or a short reflex arc, which causes even more relaxation, more uh, opening up or dilation of the stomach. And this actually is called adaptive relaxation. So this one is called adaptive relaxation. These are both important because they play a role in what's called accommodation. So these both play a role in what's called gastric accommodation. And accommodation is important because what that's saying is whenever there's an increase in intragastric volume, the pressure, the intragastric pressure stays constant for a, to a limit, okay? Obviously, there's a certain point at which the volume is too much to where the pressure will start rising. Usually, that's somewhere around to where this actually can play a factor when it's greater than 1.5 liters, then the pressure starts rising. But again, super important to understand here, the reservoir function of the stomach, remember, treat the fundus in the upper part of the body as the reservoir. How does it do it? Cephalic phase, sight, thought, taste, smell, food, food that hasn't even gotten to the stomach, trigger this vagal response to cause the relaxation of the smooth muscle to receptively relax. Food enters into the stomach, starts distending the walls of the stomach, as it starts distending the walls of the stomach, it activates either a long reflex arc or a short reflex arc, which causes the smooth muscle to relax and even dilate even more. That's called adaptive. These two play a role within gastric accommodation, which is as food is in the stomach, the volume of the stomach is increasing, but the intragastric pressure is staying constant to a certain degree until the volume is greater than 1.5 liters, then the pressure starts rising. There's one more thing that we should understand with respect to the gastric phase. So this one was the distension, right? So this was our distension. And that was the first one. The other thing is, let's say that this bolus is high in partially digested proteins. If you remember, partially digested proteins were able to activate particular cells located within the uh, lower part of the stomach, like maybe in the body or in the antrum of the stomach. And these were called enteroendocrine G cells. And these G cells were releasing particular chemicals. What were those chemicals that they were releasing? They were releasing gastrin. And what you need to remember is that gastrin has the ability to come over here and stimulate the actual smooth muscle to relax even more. So it also plays a role in this adaptive relaxation response, okay? So gastrin has the ability to cause this fundus to relax even more and continue to expand. It also does play an important role within the antrum of the stomach to cause the antrum, I'm sorry, the antrum of the stomach to contract and empty. So it has two roles. One is it can cause fundic relaxation and it can cause the antral pump to start contracting. So that's the big thing there. So now we know the cephalic, we know these two things which play a role in the gastric phase. And then again, these two things work, distension and high partially digested proteins, which if you remember, played a direct role with increase in pH, all right? Now we talk about the last thing, which is the intestinal phase with respect to this uh, reservoir. Let's say that the stomach is emptying its contents out here. And the contents that is being emptied out here into the small intestine is rich in protons, it's rich in fat, it's rich in peptides, it's rich in um, uh, carbohydrates, all these different things. This is all that kind that we put out here. When it does that, if you remember, there were certain enteroendocrine cells that could be stimulated by these different factors. One could be cholecystokinin, which is primarily in response to fats and partially digested proteins, secretin, which is primarily responding to acidic chyme, GIP, uh, which is called gastric inhibitory peptide or glucose-dependent uh, insulinotropic peptide, and that was primarily responding to carbohydrates. All of these actually play a crucial role 
and doing the same thing. They like to cause relaxation of the stomach, primarily of the fundus in the upper body, to allow for the stomach to start relaxing, collecting the food, storing the food for a little bit longer until the duodenum has prepared itself for this uh, chyme contents that the uh, stomach is trying to pump out. Okay? So that's important to understand there. One other thing, uh, we'll actually get to that a little after. We'll talk about another reflex called the enterogastric reflex, but we'll get to that a little later. Okay, so I think we have a pretty good idea of the storage function of the reservoir function. Now we're going to cover this mixing function and emptying function. They actually go hand in hand. If you remember, we said, let's do this one in this actual blue color here. In a portion of the stomach, usually, let's say like right here, let's say right here, in the body of the stomach, the mid-body of the stomach, there's special cells in this area that are generating a constant electrical rhythm. This portion here is where you're going to have those pacemaker cells. So this is where the highest concentration of these pacemaker cells are going to be. Okay, those interstitial cells of collagen, which are located in between the inner circular, I'm sorry, the middle circular and the outer longitudinal layer. They generate those action potentials, right? So they're the ones that are sending out those action potentials. When they send out these action potentials, it causes the stomach smooth muscles to contract. And usually these contractions start off within the body of the stomach. Now, here's the thing. The contractions increase in intensity and in force as you work your way down to the pylorus. That's what you have to remember. So for example, let's say that we talk about the contractions at just this point here. It might only be little rippling contractions. It might not be very strong, okay? Then you move your way down here to like the you know, lower aspect of the body. Maybe it's a little bit stronger contractions, okay? Then you move in here to the pylorus. These contractions are super intense, almost to the point to where they occlude the actual uh, lumen of the stomach. So now look at these bad boys. So this is what I want you to understand. If you work your way down from the actual upper part of the body all the way down to the pylorus, the intensity of the contractions are increasing. So don't, don't forget that. So for example, we'll have like a mini diagram right here. Let's say here you start off with the stomach here. And then you have another one. Okay. And then we'll have one more right here. Again, keep it, keep it simple here. When you start up here, the actual contractions are going to be kind of shallow, kind of a rippling effect. Then you work your way down here to like the body, and they're going to be a little bit stronger. Then you work your way down to the pylorus, and they're pretty much occluding the actual lumen. Okay? So that's the important thing to remember, that as you're working your way down from the, let's say, upper body, this is A, then you work to the lower body. Let's say that this is part B. And then you work your way down to the pylorus. This is part C. The contraction intensity is increasing. So what does that mean? When you start up here at the upper part of the stomach, all right, these uh, pacemaker cells generate an electrical potential about three to five about. The basic electrical rhythm that they have, their basic electrical rhythm, is about three to five action potentials per minute. So that's gonna generate about three to five contractions per minute. Now, when they generate these action potentials, it spreads to this part here, contracts. When it contracts here, what it does is at this upper part of the body, is it pulls and yanks some of the chyme out of this reservoir from the fundus out into the body to mix it with a lot of that actual uh, gastric juices here. Then it comes into like the mid part of the body, contracts and again tries to push the actual chyme to the next part. So right now the chyme is moving in this direction. Then we get to this part here, the pylorus. This is where it is super crucial. We really need to understand at this part. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually break the pylorus up into three little segments here. So I break it up into three individual segments. Right here and right here. There's gonna be one. So let's say we go over here, this is the proximal portion, this is gonna be the middle portion, and this last part here is going to be the distal portion. So again, we have distal, we have middle, 
and we have proximal. Now, when the actual chyme gets here, at this point here, in the proximal aspect of the pyloric antrum, when this part of the pyloric antrum contracts, it really squeezes down and occludes the lumen behind it. What's the purpose of that? To prevent any of the actual chyme from backflowing into the stomach. But this part here, distal to the proximal aspect of the antrum, relaxes so that the chyme from the proximal antrum can get pushed into the terminal or distal antrum. Okay, that's important. Okay, now let's assume that this has a mixture of particles. Maybe it has some big particles in here. Maybe it has some small little itty bitty particles in there. But there's a lot of solute particles. The significant thing here is that in order for substances to travel through the pyloric canal here, they have to be less than two millimeters in order to pass. So if this thing hasn't been, if these chemicals or these solutes haven't been reduced in size to at least less than two millimeters in, in size, they can't get passed forward. So when the proximal pylorus contracts, it pushes the contents forward into the terminal uh, antrum, right? Now, the next one is you're gonna have the middle antrum, the middle aspect here. It's gonna contract. When it contracts, it takes all of the chyme that it might have in this area, okay? All the chyme that it might have in this area, and it pushes it forward, okay? So the proximal antrum would push all of its chyme, which has different solute particles, into the terminal antrum. Then the middle antrum will contract. When it contracts, it pushes a lot of its particles, which might have, again, some big particles here, or it might have some itty-bitty particles in here but it's gonna push its substances through the pylorus canal. The reason why is when the middle antrum contracts, the terminal antrum is still relaxed and open. So it pushes out a good chunk, about three to four milliliters is pushed out here into the actual duodenum. Here's the thing though. At the same time, when the middle antrum contracts and pushes things through the pyloric canal and out into the duodenum, it also pushes a lot of that chyme back here into the back part of the stomach. Why? To continue to keep mixing with a lot of the actual gastric juices to continue to reduce those particles down in size. Now, what particles would really be moving through here? The particles that would pass through would be the particles that were tiny. You know, in other words, they were less than two millimeters in size. Some of those larger particles that weren't able to get through there, they'll actually get pushed back here into the body of the stomach to continue to get mixed with the gastric juices to reduce them in size, okay? Then you get to the terminal antrum. When the terminal antrum actually contracts, it's the interesting one, okay? It's the really interesting one. When it contracts, again, what kind of chyme could be right here? There could be large solutes. There could be some little itty bitty solutes kind of mixed in here all over the place. But when the actual distal aspect of the antrum contracts, it pretty much closes off. Because when it contracts here, it's pretty much right next to the actual pyloric sphincter. So when the distal or the terminal antrum contracts, the pyloric sphincter also contracts and closes off this lumen. So now, any substances that are in the terminal antrum can't go out into the duodenum. They only have one direction that they can go in. What is that direction? They get pushed back here. Okay? Now, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. The proximal, when it contracts, it pushes substances into the terminal antrum. That part right there, just that aspect that is carried out by the proximal antrum, this is called propulsion. It's just trying to move the solutes, again, a lot of these solute particles along. The middle antrum, what did it do? When it contracted right here, when it contracted, it tried to push a lot of the solute particles out into the duodenum, transpylorically, about three to four mls, and then some of it backwards. This going backwards and actually going outward is important because it plays two roles. One is it plays a role within the propulsive function you know, emptying the stomach contents. 
but also it pushes it backwards to mix with the gastric contents. And this right here is going to be that mixing effect. So it has a propulsive effect and then that mixing and grinding like effect. Then the terminal antrum, when it contracts, remember it's so darn close to the pyloric sphincter that it, the pyloric sphincter contracts with it, occludes the actual pyloric canal. Now no chyme can exit out. All the chyme can only go in one direction and that's back into the actual stomach uh, body to get mixed up with the gastric juices. And this is going to be called retropulsion. Okay, and that's important that we understand that. Now, because of all this, think about it again. What would happen if we were to think about this in the cephalic phase? In the cephalic phase, what would we be doing? We're getting ready to ingest food. If we're getting ready to ingest food, what are you gonna wanna do? You're gonna wanna be able to cause this food to just stay here? No, you're gonna wanna empty it so that we can make more room for the incoming food. So in the cephalic phase, what would you expect to happen in this area? It's gonna start causing a lot of contractility of the pylorus and a little bit of the body. What about in the gastric phase? Well, food is in here. What is gonna happen? There's gonna be distension, which is gonna cause fundic relaxation. And there's also gonna be a lot of partially digested proteins. That's gonna cause the release of gastrin. Gastrin will cause fundic relaxation. But gastrin also has a emptying effect. And acetylcholine, which is coming from the distension, that'll also have a contractile effect. But then the intestinal phase, what chemicals were we releasing? Cholecystokinin, secretin, GIP, all of these things, what were they doing? They were actually acting to inhibit the pyloric uh, uh, contractility because they don't want a lot of this chyme to get emptied out into this area because just dumping all that stuff out into there could cause some really, really nasty effects. So another mechanism that actually helps to protect us from that is you have receptors out here that pick up the significant distension and they actually go and activate your sympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, these nerves come here and they stimulate the pyloric sphincter to really, really contract. When it contracts, it closes off the pyloric canal and prevents any more substances from being able to be released into the duodenum. This right here is called the enterogastric reflex. The entero gastric reflex. It's a sympathetic reflex. We talked about it already um, in the uh, gastric secretion phases, okay? That's important. Now, one last thing that happens that we need to talk about with the stomach is, let's say that some little kid ingests, I don't know, a penny, all right? And when it ingests that penny, obviously those things are really big. They're greater than two millimeters. How does that penny actually get out? Because obviously we need to excrete that substance, right? Well, there's something else that happens in what's called the fasting state, and we need to make sure that we don't forget this one. This happens in the fasting state. So let's write this one down. In the fasting state, or the interdigestive period, we have what's called a MMC. This stands for Migrating Motor Complex. This happens in the fasting state when we're not eating, there's a hormone that's actually released called motilin. We'll talk about this phase more in the intestines because it is important. But what motilin can do is, is it's been found to stimulate this migrating motility complex. It's a peristaltic wave basically. And the peristaltic wave kind of starts here at the body of the stomach and just moves its way down the pylorus and tries to empty a lot of the contents out of the stomach into the duodenum. What it can empty out is it can empty out a lot of the chemicals that were actually greater than two millimeters in size. So if someone swallowed a penny or like, I don't know, a chicken bone or something like that, it could actually be pushed out because when the migrating motility complex occurs, it actually has a way of relaxing the pyloric sphincter to empty a lot of those contents out. Another reason for the migrating motility complex is what is in this area? A lot of gastric juices, a lot of hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes. The cells in this area, the surface epithelium, they're constantly undergoing so much damage that we have to regenerate those every three to six days. So there's a lot of desquamated cells or cellular debris. 
So it's just taking all of these substances that are remaining in the stomach after we've eaten and just yanking all that gook, that cellular debris, any remaining chyme, any things that weren't able to be reduced less than two millimeters in size and pushing it out here into the intestines so that we can eliminate it. So it's kind of like a housekeeping function, if you will. So there is a disease that can actually plague this, unfortunately, uh, this right here, the pyloric sphincter. My uh, fiance actually had this condition and it's called hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. And this condition is usually the result of the hyperplasia, which means that you have more smooth muscle cells, or the hypertrophy, the cells are bigger, of the pyloric sphincter. So what is it usually? It's hyperplasia and hypertrophy of pyloric sphincter pyloric sphincter. This is usually more common in boys. They genetically traced it back that it's more common in, in boys. Um, and they might believe that there is some environmental aspects that can be related to it, like certain people who use antibiotics, like certain macrolides. They've also seen that it can cause this pyloric stenosis somehow. But when we look at this, let's look at what's actually going to be significant about this. The pyloric sphincter we know is responsible for allowing for controlling and regulating the chyme exit. Let's say that this thing is so stenosis, stenosis, what does that mean? It's narrowed, okay? It's to the point where this thing is so darn thick that it is occluding the pyloric canal. And now substances aren't able to exit the stomach. If these chemicals are substances or solutes, whatever is in the stomach isn't able to exit, what is gonna happen? The stomach's gonna stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch. And eventually it's gonna activate the afferent fibers of the vagus nerve send those information up to a specific area in the medulla called the emetic center and trigger vomiting. So one of the telltale signs that you can see with these people who have uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is that they're gonna have what's called vomiting. And not just like, I'm not talking like normal vomiting. I'm talking like exorcism type of stuff. I'm talking like, oh, like projectile, all right? That's one telltale sign. Another thing with this uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is usually their stomach muscle, it gets so thick because it's working so hard to try to empty these contents out, but it's not. And there's so much distension. If you remember, the more distension there is, the more it activates those subthreshold waves and brings them above threshold, which increases the action potential, which increases the contractility. Over time, the smooth muscle gets thicker. And it gets to the point where if you watch, you can visibly see the stomach uh, undergoing peristalsis. And you can even um, feel it too. Another thing is if you do your physical examination, you palpate right around the epigastric region, they have what's this called this olive shaped mass in the epigastric region. All right. And then one last telltale sign here is if you do some blood work, what you'll notice is that the patient's pretty darn dehydrated, but they're also showing signs of what's called metabolic alkalosis, which is where their pH within the blood is really high because they've lost a lot of their hydrochloric acid, a lot of the chloride. And so because of that, that can cause metabolic alkalosis. Also, they're losing a lot of fluid, so they're gonna be dehydrated, they're gonna have some electrolyte imbalances. And so this is really important. So what they usually do with the patient is they send them to do an ultrasound. Obviously, they'll, do, they'll look at all the history and the physical and the lab work, but then they'll actually send them to do an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound shows um, some thickening of the actual pylorus area, then they know, okay, this person definitely has some pyloric stenosis. Usually this happens a couple weeks after birth, okay? And uh, with that said, what they usually do is they do what's called a pyloromyotomy, okay? They cut the pyloric sphincter to open up this area and allow for more of the contents to be emptied out into this, uh, into the duodenum, okay? So that is a little uh, tidbit on the uh, situations of certain types of GI motility disorders that can happen with respect to the stomach. I hope that made sense. All right, engineers, so in this video, we talked a lot about the GI motility of the esophagus and the stomach, and we talked a little bit about the fundamentals of motility. Again, we're going to continue this discussion, and we're going to talk more about the GI motility within the small intestine, large intestine, 
uh, in another video, and I hope to see you guys there. I'm excited to continue to keep talking to you guys about that stuff. I hope all this stuff made sense. I really do hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section. Please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance, go check out our Facebook, Instagram, maybe even our Patreon account. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.